I'd like to start because okay. I'm the one that's Should I just explain you. what we're doing? Just a uh, brief split. Okay. All right. Yeah. We decided to interview each other instead of having someone, you know, ask questions. That we we because we we work together. We work together, and so we decide. Okay, we're just going to have a conversation, and since we have a nice small group, we could actually, you know, and you guys it. can pipe in now and then. Yeah, feel free. All yes. right, go ahead, Kirsten. And I, I just wanted to start by saying that you have a terrible, terrible memory, and I don't see very well. So I brought a prop from our book, so we can always look back and see little pointers on what's going on here. So I came here to introduce Lori David. And every, as everybody knows, she, she um, produced Inconvenient Truth that she won an Oscar for. Thank you. She produced Fed Off, which is now one of the most watched documentaries on Netflix, which is amazing because it's a really difficult topic. And if you haven't seen it yet, you really should because it will change your life. It will change your family's lives. People might think I put you up to this. No, no. Okay, good. Uh -uh. good. No, no, not at all. I swear I didn't put her up to this. Um, you wrote three books, Stop Global Warming. Did you write four? There was a little pamphlet. But okay, enough first. about me. No, no, but, no, no, we're not okay. done here. We're done, no, we're not. You wrote, you wrote The Family Cooks and The Family Dinner with an amazing co-author yes. named Kiestine, and she has an unpronounceable last name. Actually, her first name is unpronounceable, too. No. It's Kiestine. No, Kiestine. Okay. So my first question to you. Okay, can I put that down now? Yes. Okay, good. But I'm okay. Uh, my first question to you: What was the inspiration behind the second book, The Family okay. Cooks? Okay. So I'm gonna just backtrack a second, and I just want to say, Kiestein is a self-taught cook. I don't think you like using the word chef, do you? Self-taught cook. She grew up on a fruit farm. I'm Chefs not joking. Chefs are mean generally. Uh, Cooks are so much nicer. She. It is. They are. She grew up on a fruit farm in Denmark. She used to have to go and pick fruit every day. And when she finally realized she could stay in the kitchen and cook, that was definitely preferable for her. She was taught by her mom and her grandmom, right? And aunts. And aunts. Mm -hmm. And she, she's the most extraordinary chef. And I think the thing about this book that is different from most cookbooks is that it's family food. We're not, not no, nothing, none of these books have to do with restaurant food. It has to do with family food. Because here's the ultimate premise, which is that if you don't make the food yourself, guys, you don't know what you're eating. Someone and, else cooked it, and they don't love you. That's exactly right. We're outsourcing, you know, the, our, the, our, the most basic thing we need for our health to strangers, to people who don't care about us. Their, their premise is they want you to keep coming back for more. So here's the, here's the deal. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be happy, she would say happy, you have to start cooking yourself. So we came up with these two cookbooks with very simple, easy recipes, very few ingredients, really healthy. The first cookbook was all about love. It was about getting your family to join you around the dinner table right. and all the benefits that come right. from that. The second book, we actually, we have this thing where we want to go on every single walk on this island and so far, you know that little booklet, Island Walks? And so far we went on one, which was like one of the out yeah. long, long beach crane point or yeah, something. Yeah. And as we were walking on this walk, I said, Lori, I think we need to write a book for kids. We need to write a cookbook for kids because if the kids don't learn how to cook when they're children, they're never going to learn. So we started playing with this idea and we started talking to other people about it and it turns out, all these parents were saying, no, 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 I want that cookbook. I want a cookbook with recipes, how to cook beans from scratch, how to make, how to learn to cook by heart. Because that's, if, it's, it's good to open a cookbook. It's even better to know 10 recipes by heart so you never have to open that cookbook. So that when you're in the grocery store, you go, oh, I'm going to make my favorite tomato sauce and I know the ingredients and I don't have to. It's so much faster, too. If you're looking and looking and looking and you have to re-look back at the, the recipe, it takes so much longer. So all these parents were saying, we want a really simple cookbook for us. So we ended up writing this cookbook for kids and their parents to cook together. We have kids' recipes in it, but we also have parents' recipe, and they're all... Family favorites. And we wanted, um, my kids were becoming, you know, they're high school, college age, and I wanted them to be able to have all the recipes that we were making in the house that we love, that were beloved recipes, like our quinoa cakes and all the soups, 
Um, we wanted them to be able to cook that stuff for themselves when they got into college and got their first apartment. So that all that went and into by the, the way, family cooks. Lori's kids do. They cook every single night. It's pretty amazing. I gotta say, seriously, I made so many mistakes as a parent. I mean, seriously. But this is the one thing I did right, and it was to insist on family dinner basically five nights a week. And I wasn't always cooking those dinners. Sometimes Kirsten was cooking those dinners. In fact, they were I, better. Cr I credit Kirsten with teaching me how to cook. But the thing is, we sat down, and I, you know, I just had this epiphany one night, and this is what the family dinner was about. Both the girls were still sitting at the table. They were like 16 and, and 17, and dessert was over, and they were still there, and they were talking to me. And I'm like, okay. Like, that's a gift. Here's another gift that they got from sitting down to dinner all the time. They associate food with water. If you teach your kids that, that's a gift they ha will have for the rest of their lives because so much of what's happening with the health problems has to do with what everyone's drinking also, including what they're eating, all the soda and juice. These kids, every meal, meal after meal after meal after meal, water, food, water, food, they crave water with food. You teach them that. And same way you teach them how to develop their palate. You teach them how to eat food. And I think the culture right now is we've forgotten that that's something we're supposed to teach people, teach children. We're supposed to teach them how to eat, to how to develop their palate, how to accept new foods. To eat vegetables, that they're delicious, and a vegetable's not just a French fries. Also, if you're cooking for them, you're, you're controlling how much sugar, fat, and salt's going into it. And if they're used to eating junk food, it's, it, it gets harder to train them to eat the food that you cook. So the more you cook for them, the better. And the more they cook themselves, the more you include them in the cooking process, the more interested they're in in tasting something new. Like they'll try a carrot that's raw if they peel it themselves. They'll, they'll eat a sliced kohlrabi, even look, though it looks strange, because they were right. part of cooking it. Even better if, you can help, if they can help you pick it. So Kirsten, what are some of your tips? Like what are some of the things that you recommend in the family cooks that everyone can do? Because you know, people say, oh, I don't have time, it's too hard. It's like, those are all, like, we've kind of been, we've, we have been brainwashed to believe that. It's, cooking isn't hard. It doesn't take that long. I mean, every meal doesn't have to be three courses. So what are some of the things that we do in the book that we talk about that people can do? Some great tips. One of them is to always have a jar of hard-boiled eggs in your refrigerator. Because when your kids are freaking out and they're super hungry, they're going to they're, they're gonna want snacks. And if you can give them a hard-boiled egg, or if you have a jar of cut-up raw vegetables in there, and you ha so you have an alternative to, to the crunchy, salty things, they'll go for it. They'll so peel carrots on Sunday, on a day you do have time. Keep them in the fridge. You can put them in a ball jar. These ball jars we use for everything. Um, carrots, making like two cups of quinoa on a Sunday, so you can add that to things or have, have it as a side dish. Have a quinoa salad in your refrigerator. We have a great quinoa recipe in, in our cookbook, but it's basically everything you have in your refrigerator that you love that's crunchy and it's tossed together with quinoa. It's in a jar. It can go with them for, as lunches when they go to school. They, it's a good snack. It's a good dinner. If you fry an egg and put it on top of a quinoa salad, you're, mm -hmm. you're good to go. What about, tell everybody what refrigerator lentils are. Lentils, the same thing, cook. We, we are so busy, and we do have to vacuum clean and do laundry and do all these other things. And work, S and, and we and have to work. go on the computer, and, go, well, and we have to check our Instagram. Yes. We have to do is, all that, right? And Twitter. And we have to tweet. We have to do the tweeting thing. So if you, if you decide Sunday or Saturday, a day you have time, that you're going to go to the market, you're going to shop for some, some things, and cook a couple of family favorites that you can have in the refrigerator for the next couple of days. That's going to help you immensely. Also, when you cook dinner, cook two dinners. Like, don't make tomato sauce for one night. Make tomato sauce for two nights. Make enough chili for three nights so that you have for tomorrow, and you also have some for the freezer, because there, there are nights where you just can't cook. And cooking, cooking 10 servings is really not that different than cooking five servings. It does not take that much more time. And it's such a blessing when you open the freezer and there it is. I, I have two tips. One is that every family should have their, their own family salad dressing. Like this is such a basic thing that everyone can make. Let, I'd love to see the salad dressing industry kind of, I mean, I'm sorry, for they, they can make something else, but we don't need to buy store-bought salad dressing that has 25 ingredients in it when you could make a great salad dressing with four ingredients and you can assign a member of your family, maybe your husband who doesn't cook or your, 
your daughter, or whoever, and that's their job. Their job is they make the family salad dressing every Sunday. We have it for the week. They get to put your family label on it. And this is something that they're going to be proud of, own, and they're going to be able to do for the rest of their lives. They'll never like store-bought salad dressing again. So that, I think and that's a fantastic thing. And if you don't feel tip. like making your own salad dressing, we actually have a recipe in the cookbook where you just squeeze the lemon, put the salt, put the olive oil straight into the bowl, and you toss it. I mean, it can't be easier than that. And every time you do that, people are going to love it, as long, as long as you get the proportions right and they're in the book. So one other thing that I learned to cook with that Kirsten taught me and for some people, it's a very mysterious ingredient, but it's so fantastic because you buy it and it's good in your refrigerator for like a year. I'm not kidding. And it's miso. And we have two really fast, great miso soup recipes in the book. So tell us about miso and our sweet potato miso soup and the cauliflower miso soup. Did you guys know Lori is a sweet potato farmer? Yes. She grows sweet potatoes and she gives them away to school. She's actually become a farmer, which is amazing. If you ever go down, if you need to find her, go down into her garden at 7 in the morning and she's got two jars of bugs in her hand and she's all angry and she's walking around and she's picking off the Japanese, Japanese beetles. beetles. Has anybody had them plant. bad this summer? This has actually been the better, best summer for Japanese beetles than in years. Anybody having a problem with them? No. They're not that bad this year. I don't know why. Maybe the cold winter. But sweet potato soup. The most nutritious part of a sweet potato is the skin. So if you can buy it organic, buy it organic. If you can't buy it organic, peel the skin off because it's been waxed. But with this soup, it's just sweet potato. It's miso. It's water. It's ginger. It's garlic, little onions. And you blend it. And it's, it's silky and beautiful. And kids love it. And so you can replace the sweet potato with the cauliflower and have it's the exactly. same recipe. Exactly, and miso is great because it replaces any chicken or vegetable broth, and it sits in your refrigerator forever. It all, it's also mm -hmm. great for dressings and dips, and it's so healthy for you because it's full of enzymes. Stocks. Because if you put water in it, it it's a stock. It, it tastes like it's very similar to chicken stock or vegetable stock. No, it depends on how much you use. I mean, if you use a lot, it gets really salty, but you don't use that much. It, and it adds this thing called umami, which is like the base to food. It's like, it's, it's this beautiful, um, it's what makes things tasty. Mm -hmm. So sh I think we should open up to questions. A lot of people don't know what miso is. Could you just give a little... Yes, miso is a fermented soy product, and you can get it at at most, I know you can get it at both Chronix here, and it's in the refrigerated section, and it comes in a square tub, and it comes in different saltiness levels. There's white, there's uh, yellow, and there's red, and I usually go with the white or the, the yellow, because the red is very salty, and it's delicious. Mm. You know, we should talk about two really quickly, and then we will beans. open it. We should beans. What do you want to say about beans? You should talk about beans because it's your favorite food in the whole world. Well, I love. I just love making food that I have for a couple days. I mean, that to me is the whole key. Is like to make something and then have it repurpose it. Kirsten's a genius at repurposing things, and we have some of that. Um, but I love white beans and tomato sauce. I love. I love. Okay, garbanzo beans. You can buy them in the boxes now. Not stay away from the cans that have BPA in them. Buy them in the boxes. Keep them on your shelves. And you tell them what we do with garbanzo beans. And kids love this we and everyone roast loves them. them. We roast just, them. We just dry them off a little bit, toss them with olive oil and a little, if you want garlic, a little garlic, a little paprika, some cumin. And then roast them until they're kind of crunchy and they are delicious. And they can, you can serve them just like that as a snack. Make sure you put some salt on it because that makes them tastier. Serve them like that as a snack. You can toss them into salads. You can put them on top of your beans. You can use them as a garnish. They don't or last. That's the thing. They, like, they belly eats them right out of a little ball jar. I mean, there's, there's such a, and it's pro, that's protein. So that's such a great thing for everybody. And of course, you can make hummus with them. But roasted pop, cal cauliflower popcorn. This is like a really popular recipe in the book. And I swear, it will not make it from the stove when you pull it out to the table. It won't make it there. But we, we were starting to make just a head of cauliflower this way. And now we have to do two heads of cauliflower. Part of Explain the how do you make this recipe. All you do is toss cauliflower with olive oil and salt and put it in the oven and it's done. Do that I with do all your vegetables. And yes. they, it literally tastes like candy. It's but incredible. Here's, here's part of Lori's secret. She is so passionate about anything she does. So she pulls out cauliflower, and if kids don't like cauliflower, she's just going, but it's the best thing in the whole world. She sells it, and that's so important 
for you to sell the food you make kindly with joy. If you apologize before you put something in down in front of a kid, they're not going to like it. Well, we have a chapter in the book about picky eaters, and this is actually one of my pet peeves is that term, because the second you use that term, guess what you have? You have a picky eater. And the thing is that it takes, you have to taste something 10 to 12 times to 15 times before your palate accepts it, right? And we have, again, this culture where a kid says, I don't like it, and the parents start say, oh, my kid doesn't eat that. And, it, and they've tried it once. And, it, and, and we, then they start making separate meals for their kids, and that makes you tired. Well, we went through that, believe me, because we used to have, we always invited our friends, our kids' friends to our house, and we had kids who wouldn't eat, and then the mother would jump up and ask if they could open the refrigerator to find something else, you know? And we put the kibosh on that very quickly. But the thing is that we teach kids how to ride a bike, right? And you put a child on a bike one time, two times, 20 times, you're killing yourself for teaching them how to ride the bike. It's the exact same thing with food. We have to teach them how to eat. That's our job. And we have to enjoy the food ourselves. And this is the last thing I'll, I'll say is that dinner has to be fun. It's got to be fun. And that is something we really focused on also because um, I would always come to the table with games, with verbal games, even something, just something in my mind like, okay, if you don't like, everybody has to rename themselves. If you weren't named Corinne, what would your name be? And you go around the table and everybody, next thing you know, you're not talking about the food. You're not talking about what you like and don't like. Or, you know, um, you're, you're playing a game. You're laughing. You're having fun. And that is what a meal should be. And so I, in, in all our cookbooks, and we have two, we have tons of verbal games and ideas for things to play around the table. And we always did that. Should we open it up to questions? We should. All right, any thoughts, questions? Yes. What Lori's you do actually Robbie? the one that taught me to do something with kohlrabi. Kohlrabi, you can put cube it, you can put it in soups, you can put it in stews, and it gets kind of soft, a little bit like a potato. But the most delicious way to do it is how Lori does it. And I think you learned actually, it from you know, Chris, Chris Fisher. Fisher taught me yeah. about kohlrabi. You take and it, honestly, a year ago, I didn't know about it until a, a year ago. You take it, you peel it, and then you slice it either very, very thinly or into like french fries kind of things, and then you drizzle a lot of either lemon juice or lime on it, some salt, a goodly amount of salt, maybe some chopped basil or chopped mint, and then serve it. It's really crunchy, very sweet, similar to a jicama, but not with the grainy texture of a jicama. It's sort of smooth like an apple. Peel it, eat it raw, crunch away. It's fantastic. A little lemon and salt. Yes. We have tons of opinions Actually, about everything. And, and we have a whole page on it in our book. What is your we, opinion of oil? We love oil. I mean, if you don't put enough oil on food, it doesn't brown properly. But what types of oil? Um, we. What do you use to cook with? We use a pure olive oil to cook with. I know that some people don't like when you get it at too high a heat, and that's a personal preference. <coughs> Um, if you don't like that, you can use coconut oil instead. You can use a high heat safflower oil. And we do mention this in the book. And also use the really good olive oil for, for your salads, right? For salads, right? for finishing things. Yeah. You don't want to use your fancy olive oil for cooking because it loses its flavor, it smokes really fast, and you spent a lot of money on, on something that you don't taste. But do use it at the end and do use it in salad dressing. In the vein of making cooking fun, too, and I learned all this from Kirsten. Like, this is such a small thing, but if you're not already doing it, start doing this and tell me it doesn't improve your life, okay? A little tiny bowl of salt and pepper out all the time on your stove. If you're not doing that, just, just see what happens. Like, you know, you, you become a chef because you can pinch, pinch, it's right there. You know, a, put music on when you're cooking. Out. You know, pour yourself a little wine. Ha light a candle. Like, ha like this is, the, I think, we think, this is the gift that each day brings us, that we get to stop everything we're doing and prepare food and share with people we love. It's a gift the day gives us. It's why we're working so hard. And no technology. Get rid of the technology at the table. Put a boundary down. We all need breaks from it, and there's no better boundary than the meal. And I mean it. I, my kids are... They're all addicted to the cell phones now. If we have a dinner and they bring it to the table, if it's in their pocket, hidden in their pocket, if I hear a vibration, I get the phone. I take the phone. And trust me, they do not want to give you the phone. So guess what happens? No more phones at the table. Done. And I really feel like we have to enforce that because if we're not stopping for the, 
for the meal to show gratitude to the people who work so hard to prepare that food and, and the gratitude for you know, the fact that we have food to eat and the gratitude that we have time with each other, then what are we doing? When are we do doing anything together other than at the same time other than sleeping? So there's no replacement for the meal and it doesn't have to be dinner, it could be lunch. People do family lunches, they do breakfast. But you have to do it because it's, um, there's so much, there's a hundred different things that happen at the table that doesn't happen anywhere else. And when people say, well, I spend time with my kids in the car, no. It doesn't, it's not happening in the car, it isn't. But it happens at the table, and I'll, I'll, okay, I'll say one more thing, I'm sorry. I'm gonna say one more thing. No, it's beautiful. Because there's amazing research on this, and I think it's such an important point. They studied, why is the dinner table so powerful? And they know, they came up with the answer at Emory University. It's the number one place where family history is passed on to family members. So it's the number one place where you hear about what grandma and grandpa did or how tough life was in the past and how they survived and what jobs they had as kids. And when you stop sitting down at a table together, you stop passing those stories on. And it's the knowledge of those stories that builds resilience and self-esteem. Okay, so if we're all eating in front of a computer, if we're, twe if we're on our phones at the meal, none of that's going on, and it's why it's such a sacred moment and why we have to start cooking and we have to sit down with each other. Amen. 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 All right, are we done? Are we finished? Any other questions? Yes, right here. Well, I'll, I think I know why. I mean, I'm going to give you my guess at that. Because people on the island haven't grown sweet potatoes because sweet potatoes was a southern crop, right? But because of global warming, honestly, the climate's changing. They're, they're actually working here really well. I'm going on my third year of growing them, and I cannot tell you. I could, you could feed the world just by growing sweet potatoes. It's, you plant one slip, and you get like eight beautiful sweet potatoes from it. So I think that's going to change, and, and we, we mostly give these sweet potatoes away to the island, but the Kronix carries them at one point. Don't you sell and them at the farmer's market, too? Well, we didn't last year, but we might. We planted so many, and they've gone crazy. So maybe you'll be able to get them at the farmer's market in the fall, too. Thank you. Have you ever sprouted them? And my grandmother used to put four chickens in, like, an avocado seed. And, and she did a beautiful them. plants out of avocado. All right, I'm going to try that. Thank you guys so much. If you feel like it, buy the book. The recipes are fantastic. Thank you. Book, the, all the book sales help support this wonderful festival.